So I've had quite a few questions over the past few months about the, you know, the differences in performance or the performance penalties of using Threadripper, you know, AMD's super high-end, essentially HEDT chips, which have insane core counts, versus Ryzen, specifically with the upcoming Threadripper 3 or 3000 versus Ryzen 3000, and what would actually, you know, have value for streamers, for content creators, because everyone has this idea of where there's diminishing returns, that Premiere or OBS will only use X number of cores, and how does that work? And I really wanted to get a video out there before Threadripper comes out, before we really focus on specific performance numbers, just kind of talking about what to expect, how the workflow varies, and what all of this really, you know, means for your content creation. Because I feel like there is a lot of kind of misconceptions and myths out there about how a lot of this works and about what you actually need. Hopefully I can dispel some of that here today. To do so, we're heading to Level 1 HQ to chat with Wendell from Level 1 Techs. We've got a lot we're going to shoot, but I'm also going to have him chat about Threadripper stuff because he has something up his sleeve that makes me oh so jealous and oh so excited. Before we get to Level 1 HQ, let's talk about our sponsor for this video. If you've watched my videos for any length of time, you've probably heard about TubeBuddy. Or at least I'd think so, but apparently 70% of my watch time comes from viewers who aren't subscribed. So this is for you. First, well, get subscribed. Maybe enable notifications. Come on now. Second, check out TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is an incredible toolkit to help you manage your YouTube channel and improve your productivity and your video's performance quite easily. You can update videos in bulk, optimize your SEO, syndicate to social media, back up your metadata, and more, all with a simple browser extension. Head to eposvox.com slash TubeBuddy to learn more and download it for free. They cover educational topics for YouTubers on their YouTube channel, and I cover YouTube news on their blog as well. That's eposvox.com slash TubeBuddy to download it for free, but do subscribe first, all right? Now, back to our journey to Level 1 Headquarters. I'm here! I made it! This is Wendell, Level 1 Tex. He has a cooler studio than I do. Although we're gonna probably rip it apart at some point soon. Destroy it. It's time for Studio 3.0. This is Studio 2.0. Ooh. Actually, it needs to be more functional. Like, I just don't even care about a set anymore. I just want it to look <laughs> good on camera. You just need the like, uh, obviously you can't do that for a million reasons, but you just need to make like the offices your studio. That way you can see that real work is happening in the background. That's what I always like to see, like the lands, like uh, Linus's, you know, new land lounge, whenever that's the background. It's like people actually do things there. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. No, nobody wants to be on camera, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah. As I mentioned, I've had a lot of questions about, you know, how many threads you need essentially at this point, because we've re-entered the core wars for performance, and specifically I'm of course gonna focus on content creation, video editing, things like that. And I made a few videos with Wendell now talking about the different modularity aspects of Premiere and Resolve and why you may see that your render was only using like 1% of your processor at one point and then more at another. And I wanted to really break this down because it's not as simple as a lot of people like to believe when they're like, Premiere can't use more than four cores and weird things like that. Depends what you're doing. Yeah, so we have two new generations of processors to look at at the moment, and that is, of course, the Ryzen 3000 and the upcoming Threadripper 3000. Are they calling it that? We're pretty sure they're calling okay. it uh, Threadripper 3000. Yeah. So, and or wait, no, actually, I don't know. <laughs> no it's a 3950, knows. so I don't know. It's like TRX 40 and TRX A. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Whatever. We got Threadrippers. We got threads for days. We've got 64, 32. Seven nanometer Threadrippers. Yeah, when it comes to using that for content creation, your individual program only matters so much. What really matters comes to the balancing of the threads, both in terms of what you're working with and actually your operating system, unfortunately, which is something Wendell's been working on quite a bit. Uh, 2990, rest, rest in peace. <laughs> Linux is amazing with the 2990. Windows, not so much. Although it's funny, the 56 core Intel CPU, it's two pieces of 28 core silicon glued together. See what I did there? <laughs> and uh, about the time, like, I, I made the prediction that about the time Intel needs this, Microsoft will have fixed it for AMD. Looks like that prediction's coming true. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever, we're gonna start, I guess, with video editing, because that's the most, like, 
easy to break. Well, actually, it's it's the least easy to break down. Streaming is going to be easy to knock out. With video editing, you have two main programs at the moment. You can throw in like Vegas or whatever. But Premiere Pro, all of Adobe stuff versus Resolve. Resolve relies heavily on the graphics card. And for the most part, you can edit in just about any higher end configuration as long as you have a beefy graphics card and you're good to go. But when it comes to the final export or the final render or certain specific tasks, you will still see different thread usage based on a couple different factors. One of that, one of those being the actual resolution of your footage. And Wendell's actually broken down the Adobe ecosystem a lot more when we were digging into some videos I have linked below, uh, trying to, you know, figure out why Resolve is so much better because we've talked about this way too much at this point. It makes me so excited. Uh, but specifically, the individual, like Premiere itself isn't just handling your footage. It's not Premiere. It's about 50 programs. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it, nuts. <laughs> there is so many different modules. And one of those modules essentially that operates is the encoder and decoder processes for your specific footage. Your footage could be recorded in H.264. It could be recorded in Cineform, ProRes, DNxHR, RAW, XAVC, you know. H.265. Hey, yeah, that, we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> AV1, you know, there, there's a million. In WMV, if you're nuts. The main counterintuitive thing that you need to know about working in video is that larger files are not necessarily harder to edit. And in fact, most of the time, it's the opposite. And the reason for that is your computer has to do so much work to decompress highly compressed footage. That's getting, that's, that's always been true of H.264 because H.264 compression is very good. H.265 compression is uh, as much better than H.264 as the thing that came before it. So H.265 is even more compressed and the computer has to do so much work to decompress that amount of footage that the editing experience is god awful. <laughs> And that's the high efficiency. A lot of people have apparently started thinking that it refers to the encode or decode process. That's actually the bit rate. It's very not efficient when it comes to actually reading and writing it. Yeah. And so how much the specific encoders and decoders, and there are specific programs that are integrated into Adobe or Vegas or Resolve to handle these different types of footage that differ from each other. So like there isn't just an H.264 general encoder. There's a bunch of different ones. Like I think Adobe uses main concept and there's like a, a, a big rabbit hole nobody actually needs to know. What actually happened there was the H.264 algorithm was implemented and then it became a legal landmine because it was so good people wanted to own the intellectual property rights to that. So there were a lot of clean room implementations and a lot of different competing implementations that have different royalty structures because you can't you can't really uh, copyright an idea and so it's like is code an idea or is code code is code an invention is code patentable there is the software encumbered by software patents it's a whole <laughs> legal quagmire of insanity because h264 was so transformative and so insane and that's what drove some of the investment in other codecs like vp9 and ultimately h265 is because companies were being liable for h264 that's why h264 decoding on linux is so problematic and like cisco has donated yeah. a an H.264 license for like Red Hat users and things like that. And the reality is that Cisco is actually paying on an estimated number of downloads a monetary amount to some organization somewhere. They, they probably got a really good deal, but they are literally paying a royalty on people using H.264 on Linux because they need that for their business use case. So. You know, I don't know, it's, you could argue that it's a snake eating its own tail a little bit, but also that's just the world we live in from an intellectual property standpoint. And that also affects affects the like trial modes and the limited exports of like Adobe's new Rush app that you could try for free. Like you can use it as much as you want, but you can only export like once or twice. And that's because H.264 is the most common codec and they literally have to pay for you to be able to use that. And so for everyone to just like keep repeatedly downloading it for free and using it is literally costing them money. So. There's a specific program, I believe it's main concept within most of the editors that handles the decoding and encoding of H.264, and that is optimized in different ways, and specifically when it comes to thread optimization, that's generally based around the resolution. You can only split up your, your video footage, think of it like an actual like piece of paper. You can only like split it up into so many chunks before you start running into problems. And so most people editing 1080p video, it can only scale to so many threads before 
it really doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the threads in order to keep processing it. <laughs> it's and, more work to split it up than to just do the work. And there's been some alternative philosophies about handling this with regards to not doing things in sequential order, processing multiple chunks at one time, and things like that. But when it comes to real time, just non-linear editing, a lot of that hasn't really worked out yet. And so if you're editing 1080p videos, Honestly, no, you're not gonna want a Threadripper. You're gonna want a 3700X or a 3900X because that is the most that you'll get out of it. But it's when you start either adding in CPU intensive effects that need to happen at the same time as your video footage being encoded and decoded. Because unless you're doing like a proper multi-step professional workflow, your render process is not only rendering all of the scene compositing and everything you do in your edit, it's also decoding your footage doing all of that and then re-encoding it all within you know x frames per second within your cpu cycles and so it can only do so much at one time whereas go ahead. well a good a good example like if you want to play with this and you get the, the demo version of davinci resolve color grading mm -hmm. davinci resolve color grading is one of the things that actually has gotten optimization attention from adobe lumetri uh, because it was mm, a dumpster fire, <laughs> not, not that many versions ago. Uh -huh. And so you could have all the parallelization in the world in terms of interpolating your footage and doing an effect. And some of the built-in effects from Adobe really do parallelize well. And then you would just do a color grade. And then it was like down to slower than real time because the color grade was taking all of the time. Well, on Resolve, the color grade has been super optimized pretty much since day one. Yep. So just doing a simple color grade in DaVinci Resolve uh, historically has been orders of magnitude faster than Premiere, although recent versions of Premiere have gotten better because a lot of users have complained about how terrible it is seeing how good other products are. And Premiere has spent the past five to eight years trying to opt some optimize more for the multi-threaded workflows because that's what was being so like taking over the market, especially with all the little, the cheese grater Mac pros that all the Greybeard video editing workstations were using and all of that, they were optimizing for that. Meanwhile, suddenly content creation got all focused on the graphics card and that's where Resolve kind of got to go in the different direction and start optimizing more for GPU offloading. <laughs> and that's why they've kind of undercut Premiere quite a bit is because they, Premiere has been trying to catch up to a specific workflow and Resolve just it was, skipped a lot of that. That's one of the ways that Adobe was kind of a victim. The 2013 Mac Pro had dual GPUs. I mean, even in this yep. super small form factor, Apple was figuring that the future of video editing and that creative workflow was GPU acceleration. It turned out to be a little more complicated than that. And so a, Adobe going in that direction with the Mac Pro meant that uh, things were really terrible for people <laughs> that had more than four cores. Yeah, and that's when Final Cut Pro took off because F Final Cut Pro X or 10 or however, they keep changing how they want to refer to that n n numeral, uh, is you know is so much more optimized for even the iGPUs on, their, on the normal Intel chips and the MacBooks. Like they, they immediately went all in on that GPU processing. Suddenly it's way better than anything else. The time in which you would start needing either, you know, effects heavy work, the time that you would really start needing higher thread counts beyond, I mean, you can still benefit from like a 10 to 12 core processor, like the Ryzen chips that are out. But in order to really need that step higher, skipping all of the other HEDT relevant things like quad channel memory, all the PCIe lanes, things like that, that I nerd out on and we just kind of made a video about is, which I'll have linked, you know, below, is for 4K or 6K, or 3.2K if you're shooting on Aria Alexis. You know, resolutions are scaling with core counts, and you keep making the picture bigger, suddenly you can cut it into smaller chunks and spread it out across your cores. And so it takes a lot more processing power just to play back a 4K video than it does a 1080p video, or a 720p video, or a 480p video. And having that much more bandwidth available on all the other stuff is just gravy. The extra memory bandwidth, the extra I.O. bandwidth, that could really make a big difference when you're editing and seeking and that kind of thing. It avoids the need for generating proxies. Proxies right. are low resolution, very large files, not large in terms of high bit rate. They're actually usually low bit rate, but the files are huge. And the files are usually, the codec is usually such that the computer can compute the position that it needs to go to in the file. With things like a variable bit rate, the computer has to, like you skip ahead on the playhead, the computer has to like scan the file to figure out where it needs to be. It can guess, but it's not gonna know exactly. Whereas when it's got the uh, uniform codec, it knows exactly where to go based on exactly how far you move the head. Little things like that you wouldn't think would be a huge time saver, but it's in the night and day difference between the performance of you know, the editing program. Especially on timelines with modern stuff. Like the big complaint that I see a lot of people come to me with, they're like, I don't understand. I recorded my game with my Elgato, threw it on my timeline, 
and if I click somewhere in the timeline, it takes like 30 seconds for it to f actually show me that frame. And if I'm scrubbing through, like it's super laggy and slow, it's because of that. Meanwhile, if you transcode or either generate proxy files using what's called mezzanine or intermediate codecs that he described, ProRes, Cineform, DNX, HR. These are super bloated, but they have that lower seek latency that allow you to do this. <laughs> and a few times I've seen people generate like 4K Cineform files. It's like, no, no, what are you doing? The Cineform, like 720p is all you need. Yeah. It'll look good when you render it, I promise. <laughs> yeah, and that's... I, I, you're a creative house. You're supposed to know your job. You don't know what you're doing. I'm I, just a lowly computer scientist. You're, you're the creative. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I've contributed to that problem when I was <laughs> talking about that in the past. It's like three years ago, but yeah. Oops. Because I'm just like, I'm just going to convert everything to Cineform. Oh, wait. That takes up a lot of space. Uh, <laughs> we got we to gotta do a dev server or a video server build because I get a script on our server that'll take the footage and generate uh, proxies that you can. So, like, you can just drag the thing to a folder and it'll auto generate the proxy so it's ready to go for the editor when I need it. They don't have to generate the, edit the proxies on their workstation, which, if you have a lot of powerful CPU, that does help. Yeah. As can, well, and if you're just bringing in footage in bulk, like if you have like a whole day's worth of shooting, you know, we shoot like 50 videos at once and then we bring it in. I don't want to have to import that and then wait for it to generate. Like I want it to just already have them going as it's ingesting. I may not come to it for the next day, but I don't want to have to already like throw it in my editor in order to wait for that. And so that kind of automation stuff is really cool. And that's what I attempted to do back in 2016. And I'm hopefully going to right my wrongs with that because I was doing it the wrong way. Just going to throw hardware at that problem until you get to a solution. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually have a couple server related things coming up that we're going to work on that will involve that as well. So su subscribe because only 40% of you watching right now are subscribed. So YouTube tells me I need to tell you to subscribe. So do it. So if you don't have the investment capability to get a Threadripper or something like that, or you're looking at movie studios where you see under their desk and they are using Mac Pros from 2011 and you're like, well, how the heck are they making these beautiful 4K movies? Uh, listen, second gen Threadripper is going to be on fire sale soon. Look at like the 2950. Don't, don't go for the 2970 or the 2990. <laughs> but the 2950, that's nice. And especially at like $500 or less. That's like the deal of the century. Yeah. So obviously wait for the right sales. But if you, you know, if for whatever reason you're just locked into what you have and you're wondering how people are doing this, it is due to that proxy workflow that we described of you're essentially editing 720p or 540p or whatever video. That's what your processor is actually editing. It's only the final render when it then takes up the full 4K. And there's been a lot of posts the past nine months or so, even on like Endgadget and things like that, where they show or they talk about movie editing workflows and they're like 4K Blu-rays aren't actually 4K because they edit everything at 1080p. <laughs> and there's a huge misconception with that that I've spent ever since I started seeing those come up, actually like interviewing people behind the scenes trying to make sure I had the right details for. It's not actually true in most cases. Like some of them are just mastered at whatever they were shot at and a lot of films aren't shot at 4K. They're shot on film or they're shot with Ari Alexa, cam Alexa cameras that are like 3.2K or something, which is, close enough and then they're edited at that but they're converted to 2k or 1080p for the proxies that's what they edit that is what they're editing they're not making the movie only 1080p they're just editing with 1080p files because it's smoother for everyone it's there's this old workflow for video editing called offline versus online editing and so the main editors would actually be the actually honestly I'd, i'm gonna say whichever offline or online incorrectly but they would be only editing from the proxies they wouldn't even see the original files the original files are shipped off to the colorist to do all the color grading because they need the full resolution source the editors are just chopping up a bunch of proxies that are 1080p or 720p and pushing it along. And that is where a big disconnect, I think, as <laughs> like the information about Hollywood and like mainstream, you know, industry production has kind of become democratized to content creation. People are kind of confused why these workflows don't remotely match because you'll have a YouTuber who has a video editing rig that's like 10 times more powerful than a professional like Hollywood movie editor. And people are like, ooh, this doesn't compute. And I was that person for quite a few years. And this is part of why. Turns out it's proxies. Yeah. But at the same time, movie editors don't have the same turnaround time as YouTubers and content creators. Like if I go shoot this video and I want it up today, I can't wait six hours for proxies to generate if that's how long it's gonna take. I need to edit the source files. And so that's where enthusiast hardware like Threadripper or X299, rip, we're gonna push that away. <laughs> uh, that's where these come into play. And so if you are doing, you know, a daily news show or working for a news organization or you produce daily or three times a week videos and you're doing it in 4K or you're shooting on a 
MKBHD 8K RED camera for some <laughs> bizarre reason, you know, you have all of those needs, then you need the higher core counts in order to actually process that footage because it can actually utilize all of those threads. A lot of the, uh... A lot of the newer cameras that are like the mid-tier enthusiast cameras will actually record full res and proxies at the same time. The C200s, things like that, and that's a big bonus. And the ones that don't still record at least in ProRes, which is still easier to edit. Like I can record 4.6K ProRes, which you would think would, you know, the files are like 200 gigabytes for like five minutes. And you would think that would be really hard to edit. And to some degree it is, but since it is still that bulky ProRes codec, it's still a lot easier to edit than the same footage recorded in like a Panasonic GH5, that thing won't play back. Like that, that, that bulky like file, the H.264 is just like super hard to play back on a lot of computers. That, that dual Xeon E5 that I built that's uh, dual eight cores, it takes 70% of the CPU to do a software decode of a 4K H.265 stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like 12 cores just to decode that in software. Yeah, so and that's before you apply any effects or start compressing yeah. at the same time. You need hardware acceleration. And that's why the iPad is so fast is because it does the acceleration in hardware. Yep. But that limits the codecs and the effects that you can use because those have to be represented in hardware. Right, those dual Xeons that are like six years old now. If, actually, they may not be, but you know. Yeah, you can like you, seven or eight. Yeah, you know, those, those Xeons from Forever. what seems like a completely different era of computing they can still decode that, that footage, whereas you throw something like that, you know, in six years on that on the same iPad Pro from today, it's probably gonna be like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> and so that is when, in, a, in the video I shot with him, I addressed the arm thing. It's not quite that simple. Um, but that is what I am interested in Apple's actual new, their new accelerator card is it's an FPGA and theoretically they can keep upgrading it. Yeah. So I'm curious to see where that direction goes, but that's besides the point. I think that's probably long overdue, in, mm -hmm. all, in all honesty, especially for video editing workflows. If there is an affordable, like, $1,000, $1,500 uh, accelerator card, that would be great. There's, like, the Red Rocket, right. but that's not the best deal. I mean, Well, and it doesn't even work anymore. Like, it was yeah. made for, like, five years ago, Red, like, the original Red footage that was yeah. created, and the new Red is not capable for it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I would pay for an accelerated card like that for AV1 right now. Like if someone, it's too early for anyone to develop that, but AV1 is a new codec that's coming up, still being worked on, but is like insanely better at compression and data rates than even H.265. And there's actually even YouTube videos you can play back in AV1 if you enable it, but the decode performance is not great. Like they're still waiting on hardware acceleration to be really figured out. But if someone had made, you know, a slotting card that lets you compress and encode to it in at least real time, that would mean all of my storage servers full of footage that are eating up space, I could compress it significantly more than I can currently with H.265 or H.264, theoretically, and make it go. And I would buy a dedicated card to do it because on CPU, it's like 100 times slower than real time. So I would be dead before I finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too many videos. Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of, I, I, I'm a data hoarder, I, I know. <laughs> also, what Threadripper offers over 3900X or the Intel side and things like that also has to do with the extra peripheries. And I, I, I've i gone on a kind of like Don Quixote raid ever since I saw a couple other channels being like, we're switching to i7s for the iGPU performance in Premiere when that sacrifices everything that HEDT offers because not a lot of people talk about that. And so I've harped on the details of like having NVMe cache drives for your video editing because it literally cuts your performance in a third if you don't for certain workflows. <laughs> I even doing my benchmarking for a video I have, I got, I'm gonna supplement it with this video, but I'm gonna have some graphs of some performance of like the 3900X versus my 7980XE. Just having a faster NVMe drive that I'm rendering to for my bigger files literally takes me from an hour and a half on my i9 with more threads and more RAM to 26 minutes on the 3900X <laughs> with like a third of the RAM and a weaker graphics card. In NVMe life hacks with right. Ecos box. Like, yeah. I'll give you a really a really easy one. <laughs> Get a two terabyte NVMe and then don't like, just use it as a scratch drive. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about like triple level cells or quad level cells, just mentally have or a third or a quarter the capacity. So you get the two terabyte drive, just assume that that's a five, a 500 gigabyte drive from a few years ago. So you can use 500 to 750 gigabytes of that two terabyte capacity. Once and, you go past that. And be guaranteed the most face melting speed ever. But once you go past that, it's gonna be, and it's cause it's using 
the the flash and single level cell mode mm -hmm. until all of the single all of the cells at single levels have been set, and then two levels, and then three levels, and then four levels. So when you get into the last quarter of that drive, it's going to be real slow. There was one final uh, point I just wanted to add in that I always forget to mention because I barely use it, but if you use After Effects, it is not a video editor, despite <laughs> the fact that people think it is because you can edit videos with it. It is not a NLE or non-linear video editor. It is an effects and graphics compositor, and it is very single-threaded optimized. Like my 9900K with only 16 gigs of RAM, and keep in mind After Effects loves RAM too, will render After Effects projects like in half the time that my 36 thread 7980XE with 128 gigs of RAM, and it will use all 128 gigs. It renders in like half the time because it has that faster individual core speed. And so if for whatever reason you watch this and you're like, I use After Effects a lot, what are you talking? <laughs> it depends on what you're doing with After Effects too. After Effects is one of the programs that still scales well to multiple computers on the network. That used to be true of Premiere. Cause it can just basically true. send out all the different frames. Yeah. And then another computer will put it together. And that works really well when rendering a single frame takes more than a few seconds. Right. When it's, you know, that's the whole old cluster point. Like when you can do it faster and one, then why would you split it up? But although it does make me wonder why they don't start, maybe with like Numa nodes or something, like having frames rendered, like Cinebench, like you can oh, render yeah. chunks of the frame simultaneously. Why not have like chunks of threads rendering the single frame? A lot of the special effects aren't designed for that. That's that's very true. It's what, it, what it comes back to. That's very it all, true. It's all it all leads down to like there's one programmer that wrote a special effect, and it's like no. Yeah. Which is why Adobe doesn't change a whole lot because there's so many modules <laughs> and factors to play into it that would all break if they suddenly like change the rendering engine or something. Yeah. That's why you saw from Final Cut Pro 7 to Final Cut Pro 10, it was a completely different ecosystem. Same kind of thing, but. I wanted to super quick address some benchmarking I got to do after this video was recorded. Uh, Wendell ended up getting his hands on a dual AMD Epic, the new generation, 64 core system. So that's 128 cores split across two CPUs, 256 threads with SMT enabled. However, Windows was not cooperating with that many threads. It apparently worked beautifully on Linux, but he had to disable multi-threading on Windows. So only 128 threads or cores, but you know, threads. And I went ahead and did one of my benchmark runs. I was doing this remotely, so I couldn't copy over all the big bulky tests I do. So this is fairly simple. This is a combination of ProRes Cineform H.264, I believe an H.265, and then I threw in a B-RAW, Blackmagic RAW file into the timeline and mostly transcoding. There's a little bit of scaling, but super basic just to show you the effect that codecs have on your thread usage. And you can see here in this first render, I am doing and H.264 encode, as well as, you know, decoding all of the footage. And at most we're seeing, even for 1080p and 4K stuff, and most we're seeing 20 to 25 threads even getting used, and fewer than that actually getting maxed out. That is how little out of all of these threads we're using. Now I will address here that Resolve on Windows does not respond to multiple NUMA nodes, which is how he has the split up. There is one node per CPU, so it's basically only using one of the CPUs. But out of 64 cores, it is only using like 20 to 25 and only maxing out very few. But that's for the H.264 encoding and decoding. If we throw in a DNX HR encode, which is much more thread optimized, you're looking at it's using up every thread on the first CPU and maxing out significantly more for a 4K encode. So if I had more DNX HR source footage, like if you had a workflow optimized for this, then you'd see even more be able to be used because it's decoding and encoding at the same time. And of course, throw in some processor heavy effects and things like that. Now I tested Cineform as well, and it had nearly the same thread usage as H.264. So really, if you're looking to get the most out of a multi-core system, or if you're trying to figure out what would be the best solution, DNX HR is the way to go. I confirmed this back in the summer when I was testing the 2990WX, which is the Threadripper 2 processor that did not run well on Windows at all. And DNX HR, once again on there on Linux, was able to really max out the whole CPU and show a significant difference between Windows and Linux. Just wanted to throw that in here. In terms of streaming, the same principles apply 
but it's a lot simpler because most people aren't streaming anything higher than 1080p 60. I do think we're gonna start seeing people push those boundaries, especially now that Mixer allows like 10 megabits per second for partners and things like that. Like as the supported streamer rates increase and once Twitch actually gets off their butts and implements a better transcoding system, we're gonna see that even more. They're waiting on VP9 and a couple things. But currently for 1080p streaming, again, you're limited to like 20 threads in X264 for that to really, like that, that's kind of the sweet spot before you really start. 20 threads took a lot of tuning. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, like you throw it on a 2990WX, it's not even gonna use all the cores and you're actually gonna get worse performance for the cores that it does use yeah. because it's trying to spread out the single frame to way too far and then piece it back together and it just doesn't hold up. And so honestly, if you're streaming 1080p or lower, 3900X, you can stream anything pretty much on slow. Anything at all, pretty much. I mean, if you're playing at the same time, there's some limitations. I have a whole video about that. But that's 12 cores, 24 threads, leaves you a couple threads for background processes. That's all you need. Once you start pushing it, like I do a lot of video recording at 4K because I make 4K videos. I record my screen, my desktop. Currently, even on my i9, I can't really do that. I had on X264. I have to use my graphics card and there's many little reasons why I don't always want to do that and as we start seeing more of that and you may think I don't want 4K, the same people who say they don't want 4K are moving to ultra wides, which are even crazier than 4K. <laughs> they start getting all even weirder and you start doing that or any sort of high frame rate recording which is a new trend that's sort of going and people are pushing for 120 FPS streaming on Twitch. Once you get to these weird, you know, boundary pushing use cases, <laughs> That's when you start, you still have to fine tune it deeply on Threadripper, but that's when you start actually having a need for these higher end CPUs. Turns out some of those optimizations in those compression codecs assume as aspect ratios like four by three or 16 by nine. When you enter like 21 by nine and like 32 by nine, stuff starts to fall apart. Yep, even on Invink, which is, you know, I, I kind of brag about a little bit as being more game streaming optimized when it comes to quality and things like that. In terms of actual aspect ratio stuff, you start running into some weird stuff. I can record on my Titan RTX, which has the same Invink as all other 20 series. You know, it's not special in that regard, but you know, a very expensive graphics card. I can record 4K, 120 FPS. I can't record 3440 by 1440 at 100 FPS. I discovered just yesterday. It literally won't even engage the encoder. The encoder just says, I don't know what to do with that. That doesn't make sense to me, no little things like that, that you're gonna start going back to CPU for certain things, and if it's not optimized for it, it's gonna perform worse, period. Yeah, turns out, that's, now, that's actually gonna be a problem for AMD is that a lot of the optimizations on their desktop parts uh, aren't there because their parts are really, there's it's server first. All of the features from, uh, from the AMD Epic, they are made for customers like Microsoft and Amazon because those are huge potential money makers for AMD. Uh, these other markets are relatively small compared to the Microsofts and Amazons and you know uh, Salesforce.coms. Those people are buying server CPUs like crazy. And so a lot of the, the weirdness in the game performance and like Numa nodes and crap like that doesn't matter for servers. Really, right. it really doesn't. It doesn't matter for server operating systems. Arguably it matters a little bit if your server operating system is Windows, but <laughs> Sadly, Windows is not really running on bare metal and very many data centers anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> even like the whole Azure thing, but. Uh, um, and so Amy's got a lot of work to do to optimize their products for the desktop. And we see that, you know, we see that in the launch of the 3000 series Ryzen CPU, some of the rough edges, but they're gonna have enough money to hire the people they need to get it done. So I'm not worried about it for the long term. Short term, it's gonna be really interesting. That's why I honestly, like people thought it was just because I was too busy shilling for Intel at the time, but that's why I didn't recommend Ryzen 1000 a whole lot. There were some little issues there that made me a little uncomfortable. I'm totally cool recommending 3000 at this point. Like there's still issues, but they're significantly like less important or less impactful. They're pretty much plug and play unless yeah. you're gonna like try to do overclocking or yeah. if you're gonna use it with a crap power supply, or if you can use it with crap RAM, or you're gonna like try sketchy PCI Express <laughs> peripherals, those are the places where you're gonna run into problems and overclocking. But if you're, if you're not gonna overclock and you're just gonna plug it in and use it for what it is and not try to use a power supply from 10 years ago, <laughs> you'll be fine. Yeah. And, uh, and the other kind of benefits you get, again, quad channel, six, eight channel memory, potentially on the workstation thread rippers that are coming out. 
that seems super intangible for a lot of game streamers and for a lot of people it doesn't matter a ton but when you start getting into like the number one recommendation i still have to make a video on this and i'm hoping at some point i'll get some level one hardware we do some experimenting in real time but a lot of people when i talk about the gpu allocation issues for game streaming in windows people are just like well, throw a second gpu in and tell obs to do that but if you do that on a normal consumer chip between the PCIe lanes and the slower memory, because all of those textures have to go from the graphics card your game's running on, through your memory, to your CPU, back to the memory, or I had that backwards, but you get the idea, through your, your normal CPU and memory, back to the second graphics card. There's a lot of performance penalty, both for your game and for your stream, that just doesn't let that work for a lot of reasons. We run into that a little bit with Looking Glass, because mm -hmm. Looking Glass copies the frame from the graphics card to memory and then to the other graphics card. And so even though with PCI Express by eight, there is a minimal performance degradation for gaming, you, it doesn't leave you a lot of overhead for other things. And so if you're using the NVENC right. uh, encoder or you're doing other work on the GPU while you're gaming, that will really hurt your experience. Uh, Apex Legends, I think, is still struggling with that a little bit because- It's still struggling with they normal fixed it, I think with, well, it's better when it's in 16 lane modes, but a right. lot of people still complain. And on our forum, nine times out of 10, we find that they're, uh, GPU is running it by eight. And so even though Windows is reserving a little bit of GPU now, which is an improvement over a year ago, uh, it's not enough because there's not enough bandwidth between the uh, graphics card and memory for whatever else it is that's going on. So by eight, it's not really enough anymore. Right, and this is specifically what the new, the new NVENC implementation in OBS back in February was to kind of help fix because you already had that round trip of going from graphics card to memory to graphics card for encoding because oh, most video encoders assume you're sending it to the CPU to go somewhere else. And so they implemented this as a zero copy encoder where it stays on the graphics card. And that was specifically to get some of that weird latency of performance smoothed out. So throwing in a second graphics card kind of defeats that point. But <laughs> when you don't have enough bandwidth between yeah, the two things. But when you move to having the bandwidth, the faster, you know, the memory, the lower latency, you can start opening doors for that, especially for the virtualization kind of situations as well. Now it's also possible that to copy those textures directly over the PCIe bus, but uh, AMD has done the most work here, um, and NVIDIA has really not done very much work at all. They want to do everything over NVLink, and so in the enterprise, uh, like their enterprise, their machine learning accelerators and stuff like that, there was a huge benefit for copying stuff over the PCI Express bus from one machine learning accelerator to another one or from one Tesla to another. But ultimately it was like, no, we're just gonna have to do the, the interconnects. We, don't, we, we can do it over PCI Express, but NVLink is gonna be a way better situation. So we might see someday, like, I mean, there are yeah. enough streamers out there now, maybe you could do NVLink between you know, a, like a 1650 Ti streamer edition yeah. and a, you know, a 2080 or something like that. I've had talks with NVIDIA about trying to implement that or to make their own capture card that has NVENC on board, those kinds of things. They're interested, but nothing's coming out anytime soon. Um, but that would make me curious to test dual GPU streaming with AMD since their crossfire and stuff already runs through the bus. Yeah. Eh, that's a whole another rabbit hole to go on. We uh, don't need no memory. We <laughs> can just copy through the bus. This has been... I, I wanted to get this out there. I like making videos that serve as basically giant wiki pages for things that I can't explain in a tweet because people can't be convinced in a tweet and they're like, but I want to learn more. And I'm like, I can only type so much. <laughs> Hopefully this helps. Either way, the new AMD stuff is phenomenal and you should check it out. Just pick wisely, wait for... We probably got like a month before this starts really dropping in price for Threadripper 2. Or two, three. three. Third. third yeah, gen when three Ripper. comes out and third two drops Ripper in price. On Zen 2. Uh, I understand if you're confused about all that. Thankfully, they maintain some degree of backwards compatibility, so they make it a little bit more easier. But yeah. Uh, Zen 2 Plus. <laughs> Woo! If you oh, want right. more AMD coverage, uh, Wendell already has significantly more than I do. Go check him out. Level 1 Techs and Level 1 Forums. Description links it, below. It's, it's worth also checking out the RX 5700 and the XT for content creator workflows because as inexpensive as those cards are, they enable mm -hmm. some really incredible GPU accelerated workflows. And supposedly the latest Resolve 16 beta fixes all of the glitching that was happening. I am not able to test this at this point, but other people can probably confirm that for you, but otherwise, performance-wise, I have a whole video comparing it in Premiere and Resolve. Performance is just insane on those cards, so definitely check those out if you're looking for, like, a complete build-out or a render server or something, because you might be surprised. 
see ya.